we officially start. But hi, I'm Amber Dawn. <laughs> Um, and we are poetry reading and discussion with Amber Dawn, um, and you have my permission to record this Zoom session. Beautiful. Hey, I love it when it's that easy. I think the way that we're trying to design it is allowing for them to navigate how they feel, and they can so they can navigate it based on how they're feeling. So it is kind of like asking how they're feeling, or allow for them to feel differently. It does sound like an excellent sound, Michelle. I'm not sure that makes sense. I'm not sure that Michelle's mic is on. Yeah. In the defensive things. That's okay. It sounds like a good plan to me. I think we all heartily endorse it. All right. How has Pride Week been going at McEwen? Well, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because, I mean, I'm the primary organizer. Um, so, you know, the jerk side of my brain, because it's always present, is like constantly waiting for some kind of disaster to strike, some major controversy. Uh, but I think the fact that it's uh, 10 o'clock on Friday and that hasn't happened yet is a pretty good sign. Um, yeah. I, I have been really pleased. We've had good turnout to the events. We've had really, um, people have been really willing to engage and the momentum has just been building over over the whole week and now it's it's Friday already. So I think it's going really well. My boss is here, so you'll have to ask him. He hates it when I call him my boss. He, he prefers I call him my colleague, but you right. know. Chris, uh, you're, what, what do you think so far? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yes, on, yes, on all accounts to my colleague. Um, it's been uh, wonderful. It was a challenge to uh, produce something all virtual and online, but with that challenge came tremendous opportunity to partner with other universities and organizations and expand the reach, work with uh, community groups. And mm -hmm. um, I just think the, the diversity, the, the quality of the programming has been uh, outstanding. Uh, I've had students from my class attending different events through the week, so I've been able to hear their reflections on uh, on this as a not just a celebratory but a really educational uh, series of events as well. So I think uh, I think we hit the, the sweet spot so to speak and uh, we're building towards the the big uh, final closing performance tonight that'll be uh, live streamed uh, through uh, Fruit Loop here in uh, in Edmonton with bunch of amazing drag and burlesque performers including some McEwen students and alumni and we have special uh, shout outs planned throughout the the event and it's also been a way for us to um, engage and support our local um, arts community particularly hard hit during the time of COVID yeah. so to put people to work and showcase yeah. all of their various uh, talent and uh, uh, exuberance. Um, it's it's been uh, I think a win 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 for for everyone. So um, I think we'll we'll take this learning forward into next year. Um, uh, that's what it's what's all about, right? We we need to celebrate pride and um, yeah. ensure that there's a broad representation and diversity of voices and perspectives. And I think just as Jessica said, has managed to uh, accomplish that uh, really well. Oh, well, this is really heartening to hear. I looked at your week's programming and it's outstanding. It's, it's radical, you know, and it centers um, uh, cutie BIPOC voices as well, which, um, you know, I, I'm, I deeply admire. So thank you both for all your work this week. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's going so well and that the engagement's been, has been good. It can be, um, you know, a lonely time uh, in particular for, LGBTQ2S uh, students. So this is, it's so necessary. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're, we, we can also look at it as um, celebrating the one year anniversary of our two week lockdown. You know, we need a party. We've, uh, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've made it through a, a pretty intense year. I don't really know. I, I lack the vocabulary. Um, but I think the fact that we we've made it through some pretty intense trials and we still have a ways to go but that needs to be honored and celebrated especially for folks who are extra isolated because of their how they experience marginalization so yeah it's um this has been a labor of love it's my rainbow baby um so 
yeah um i mean i could go on and on but it looks like we we're a little bit past 10 now yeah and, uh, <laughs> yeah so maybe maybe we can get started um but i i have a it feels so comfortable i'm sure there'll be lots of just uh, twists and turns in the convo as we go so um first of all i'd like to welcome everyone to this event uh some poetry reading and exploration with amber dawn uh as part of uh, Pride Week at McEwen, and it's not just McEwen because we have uh, staff, students, and faculty from four institutions that are formally taking part in this event. So, welcome to everyone from uh, for joining us. Um, I think it's really important that we start with a, a call to mindfulness of where we are. Um, we're coming to you from beautiful, sunny Treaty Six land and Edmonton and area and um, you know this is a traditional homeland of diverse cultures uh, including the the Métis, the Cree, Nakota Sioux, Sodo and and many others and I think pride is an extra reminder of the responsibilities we have to ourselves to each other and to the land on which we live so I'm, I'm very grateful to be a visitor here on on Treaty 6. And uh, Amber Dawn, you come from some incredibly beautiful um, Indigenous land as well. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to pass it over to my, my new best friend, Chris, who's going to formally introduce you. We decided that since you uh, you know each other well already at this point, and I'm, I'm the stranger in the mix. So uh, thank you so much, uh, all of the participants being here. Thank you, Amber Dawn, and I, I pass the conch to you, Chris. Hi, thanks, Jessica, and, and welcome, everybody. And uh, it's really an honor and a, and a privilege to be introducing Amber Dawn. And, um, uh, I come to you from uh, the English department and also uh, the Visiting Canadian Author Series, which is co-hosting. So we're, we're just really happy to be uh, part of the celebration of Pride Week and to welcome Amber. So I'll, um, I'll read a quick uh, blurb uh, on Amber Dawn. Uh, Amber Dawn is a novelist, a memoirist, a poet, and uh, I would say a lyric essayist. Her work blurs, mixes, and challenges genre boundaries, confronts cultural taboos, and exposes and troubles our unexamined assumptions about gender, sex, trauma, and our beloved liberal institutions, academia. Amber Dawn's debut novel, Sub Rosa, won the Lambda Literary Award for debut uh, lesbian Fiction and the Writer's Trust of Canada Prize. Her memoir, How Poetry Saved My Life, a Hustler's Memoir, won the Vancouver Book Award. Uh, she's won uh, so many accolades and prizes. I just, I, I'd like to get them out there because it's, it's so impressive. Um, her poetry collection, Where the Words End and My Body Begins, was a finalist for the Dorothy Live Say Poetry Prize. Her sophomore novel, Sodom Road Exit, was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, the BC Book Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, and a Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She is the editor of three anthologies, including With a Rough Tongue, Femmes Right Porn, Fist of the Spider Woman, Fear and Queer Desire, and Hustling Verse, a uh, anthology of sex workers' poetry. All of her books are published with Arsenal Pulp Press. And her latest book, My Art is Killing Me, appeared recently in 2020. And uh, without any further ado, I welcome Amber Dawn. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, both Chris and Jessica. And you know, Chris Hutchinson, when you held up uh, the copy of my most recent book, and I saw the yellow tabs sticking out of it. I don't know if there's anything more flattering that I could have in my bio than seeing an esteemed colleague have marched tabs in my book. So thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I am coming to you from uh, where I have settled my home, which is on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. Um, colonially known as Vancouver. Hi, it's early morning here for me. It's just uh, not even 10 past 9 a.m. Thank you for joining for some early morning queer poetry. Um, 
Before I get started, uh, I had the chance to talk uh, with both uh, Chris and Jessica about uh, how Pride Week has been going at McHugh and now we're looking at a virtual Pride Week. I'm sure for many of you, you never imagined a virtual Pride Week prior to uh, the past year that we have been in. Um, and I, I truly want to look at this as a celebration and a radical act of um, LGBTQ2S visibility and justice. Um, you know, when we think about pride, uh, you know, if, if we know our queer and trans history, we, we might think first about Stonewall, uh, which is now celebrating its 52nd anniversary. 52nd anniversary, <laughs> think about that. Um, I was lucky enough, uh, not last summer, but the summer before, um, to visit the Stonewall Inn in um, New York City and the Manhattan's Lower East Side um, for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. And um, it made me think a lot about our right to gather, um, how well we can access gathering spaces, and what are all the things that have um, been barriers to uh, LGBTQ2S people being able to gather together. And there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors, you know, from gentrification, from being pushed out of um, affordable spaces, spaces that were accessible, especially to uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous uh, queer folks, um, to what we're looking at now, and that is our right to gather online. So before I get started reading, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, queer and trans people on the internet, because no surprise, just like we're badass in the streets and badass at our festivals and badass in, um, you know, the bars and clubs, we have been badass on the internet for a really, really long time. Um, for those of you that are a bit older, um, there used to be this pun that AOL, which was kind of one of the first like internet uh, platforms was called gay OL because there were so many gay men and men who have sex with men, um, trans and non-binary people that were using this early, early platform. Planet Out predates Facebook by eight years. And in fact, there is a lot of uh, queer and trans innovators in social media who um, who had interactive websites before most libraries did, before most financial institutions did. Uh, queer and trans people needed to find each other and a lot of times anonymously uh, too for safety reasons. And so there's a lot of innovation that goes unrecognized uh, in terms of queer and trans uh, contributions to social media and to the World Wide Web as we know it. Um, for those of you that maybe did live journal when you were younger, um, had, a t had a Tumblr, you know, that was a really great place to express sexualities, desire, um, things that probably would be censored um, in sort of everyday discourse could thrive online. Um, and, and, and things changed uh, in 2018, uh, in April, to be exact, uh, a bill called FOSTA-SESTA was passed by the US Senate. Um, and that's an acronym for Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act. Um, so this was passed and um, it, it changed the way that we used the internet. Now, for those of us that hear um, sex trafficking, we're like, yes, it's bad. Like people shouldn't um, be doing any kind of sexual act without consenting to it, without having some sort of autonomy over choices. Um, but really what Fausta and Sesta did is it created a way for the internet to censor expressions of identity and sexuality. And this has had a profound effect on queer and trans people. Um, shadow banning, I'm not gonna explain what shadow banning is. Most of you listening know more about it than I even do. Um, but shadow banning um, and also just tearing down accounts, um, you know, platforms like Facebook or Instagram, just tearing down content um, has become a common practice. And um, 
again, queer and trans people have been hit by this very, very hard. Sex workers, of course, first and foremost, we should think about them. Um, I'm an experiential former sex worker, so um, I know how important it is to have space to not only make money, but also be able to exchange information and create safer workplaces. Um, so FOSTA says to really mess with that, but it messed with us too. It messed with all of us. So some hashtags, by the way, that are now shadow banned that will be unseeable or torn down are things like lesbians of Instagram, shadow banned, um, decolonizing beauty, shadow banned, gay Asian, shadow banned, boys in tights, shadow banned, girls with hairy armpits, shadow banned, same love, shadow banned two boys kissing and I could go on. So, you know, it, it's truly, truly is a radical act and an act of reclaiming space that has been taken from us to have a virtual pride. Um, while it may not have been what we chose, we may not be um, necessarily feeling empowered by the realities of this pandemic. I just want to cheer for us because we, once again, are fighting for space, we're taking up space um, and we're taking up space that's that's being disrupted by power holders like the U.S. Senate. So fucking A, here we are. We're amazing. Um, you get a lot of F-bombs with me. <laughs> so that'll be my first content warning. Uh, there, there's a lot of cussing um, in my poetry, which I'm going to start reading for you now. Um, as Chris Hutchinson mentioned, uh, my work is very trauma-informed. Um, I'm going to stick to more of the um, the lighter and, and more romantic and loving um, parts of my poetry. So I'm not going to like hit too hard, but there is some mentions of sexual harassment. There's some mentions of grief very briefly. So I just, I want to let you know that before I get going. All right. So here's my plan. I'm going to read my newest poem, something I wrote during this pandemic. And then I'm gonna read the, one of the first queer poems I ever wrote, something I wrote in like the 90s. So that's, I'm gonna go in reverse chronology. Um, I'll read four things for you today. So all of the poetry I'm gonna read for you today does look at um, queer gathering or queers finding each other. Um, and I'm gonna begin with one that takes place uh, in Italy on uh, a family trip that I did a few years ago. It's called Pliriminal Rights. Che il piccolo paese means this small place where I met a man who arranged my stay at the empty Carmelite monastery. I chose the room with the tall wood door that locked from the inside. After work was done, all the good men of Pacentro, Abruzzo, wolf packed the cafe chairs, shoulder to shoulder around the piazza fountain. One man followed me back to the monastery each night. One man shouted bel culato each time I passed. Nice ass. One man told me the only appropriate response to bel culato is grazie or perhaps a sassy lo so. I know it. One of the few phrases I know so well that my subconscious has spoken it back to me in dreams is lasciami stare. It means leave me alone. One man sang me a nasal wedding march. One man threw copper coins at my feet. One man convinced me to ride an Appaloosa through Paso San Leonardo, where I heard a ringing bell on the other side of the mountain ringing and ringing, and for reasons I cannot explain, the sound made me cry in measured fits and the horse pulled back her spotted ears. One man brought me homemade wine and ratafia. One man offered to take me dancing in the city. One of the few phrases I know so well that my subconscious has spoken it back to me in dreams is volio ballare. It means I want to dance. I drank too much at the club in Pescara and found queer women in that muddled buzz. We danced together in a tight circle like the four oxen in Aesop's fables, the men in the club, lions, prowling. 
These queer women listed the times homophobia nearly killed them. I understood perfectly when they asked me what Canada is like. Is there libertap per lesbi in Canada? I furiously recorded the words I misunderstood in a notebook as if one day I might retroactively follow meaning. I couldn't call upon language fast enough to be of any comfort. The next day, my hangover clotted my tongue and I spoke to no one. In my notebook, drawn up in drunken hand, the words, siamo più sicuri se restiamo insieme. We will be safer if we stick together. One man slipped me a strip of condoms in a folded napkin. One man pulled my hair when I called him stonato. One man spit three times whenever I took a table at the cafe. After work was done, those with families resting in the high walls of Pacentro Abruzzo climbed the cemetery steps to the lynchin moss flecked feet of Mary. I too have kissed the virgin stone toes. Kissing a woman's feet is a scaramancia, I understand. I went further up the mountain, past the bony Nona who stopped hanging white sheets on the line to warn me of wild boar in the woods, past large pod stray dogs that appeared and vanished along the path, past the almighty cicadas that keened in the warp heat, higher still I heard antelopes bleat. I beat a silver birch branch against the dry rock, determined to protect myself. For as long as I can remember, I've been afraid of men. But there, up the mountain, I found the shepherd's cave I had once seen in a photograph. Ancient stone, each one the size of a human skull. I edged my way in carefully, as if the stone might wake. I knelt before the altar, where someone had recently placed a new gold embossed Holy Mary card and a wax candle. Behind her, other holy cards grayed against the cave wall. Great Gabriel, Great Magi, Great John. I prayed, not the rosary, psalms, or any grace I had learned as a girl. I prayed, please, I don't want to be afraid anymore. I'll do anything, please. O oh, paura, paura lasciami, please, unafraid, please. Thank you so much. Um, that's probably the most challenging of what I have to read for you today. So um, we're going to move into a few more poems about queer gathering. Um, I'm going to read from this book here. It's called Where the Words End and My Body Begins. Um, and it is a book of a very specific form called the Glossa form. Um, for those of you studying poetry, perhaps working with Professor Chris Hutchinson, um, maybe the Glossa has been introduced to you. I really recommend looking it up. It's a, it's a beautiful, rigorous uh, poem that works intertextually. I won't get into all the rules of the form. Let's just skip that. Um, but what is interesting about working intertextually is um, as a Glossa writer, I get to choose four lines um, of an existing poem that really inspire me. And then I get to work uh, sort of in a response to those four lines and build a poem around those four lines. Um, so the first four lines that I have chosen is from a poet named Brenda Shaughnessy. And uh, Brenda wrote, I'm angry. I'll take back the night using me to swoon at your questionable light. You had me chasing you, the world's worst lover, over and over. And my poem is called Queer Infinity. We tried to make the 2000s a hold fast decade. Many of us got sober or adopted cockeye dogs named Radar. We craved long-term goals, five-year plans, but why? When this time the world really seemed to be ending. Supermoon, Katrina, Cyclone Stan, Frankenstorm, ice caps melted in our ozone epic bubbles burst. We knew there'd be no reply during the tsunami. Still, we phoned Kerala in Chiang Mai. 
our queer transmigrant family span the four corners. There's a crisis in every time zone. It's true, I'm angry. I'll take back the night. Use me to call Amsterdam at midnight to relay a friend's death notice. Use your car to drive to the airport and to the airport again. Use her stove top to make two weeks worth of one pot meals for the freezer. Use my ax to chop wood for the funeral fire. Use each other's raw bodies to remind ourselves how to pray. Queer grief is a blueprint. We got this shit wired tight. Maybe we've become too good at losing. Are we trauma bonded? I can't speak for the whole, only myself. I'd sooner howl at a wounded moon. Yes, I might swoon at a questionable light, but at least I still swoon. My scabby kneecaps may always weep pink. I'm so often floored. I'll never be a two feet on the ground, girl. Let me guess, age isn't tempering your passion either. Let me guess, your passion like mine is only becoming more strategic. It's not called a movement for nothing. Anonymous or rough, queer sex is our coup de coeur. Many of us couldn't love ourselves until our gaping pasts were licked like wounds. Young guns in leather boots, odd ones with knuckle tattoos. You had me chasing you for years before I understood what I was after. An antidote that smoked with the same sweet fever as the venom. Pain can be fine if you share the sting. Stomach those poisons together. Many of us gathered our lovers, renamed our friends sister and brother. We wrote the books that queerlings now read in college. We made films to screen at Sundance. Our scrappy manifestos got exposure, three million YouTube views and counting. Let's erect guerrilla monuments to those who didn't make it. Never confuse hold fast with hold still. There's so much left to do, swoon. I say swoon forever. Apathy is the world's worst lover. And yet over and over, this is our queer infinity. Okay, I'm gonna have a little sip of some co coffee here. Hold on. I have, I have one more from the same book, The Book of Gloses. Um, this is a love poem that I wrote for my wife um, on our six year anniversary. And it begins with a four lines from um, Hamilton, the poet Hamilton, um, who also publishes under Jane Eaton Hamilton. And those four lines are, I watched your breast, which was fuller than the night on my porch when I first undid your buttons. The sheet beneath you was green. It was almost our anniversary. I watched your breast which is fuller than when we met. I thought you were starving, raw bone butch lap like a wooden chair. I vowed to feed you everything I had. Tender a feast, charm your tongue with salted green peas, drunken apricots, sun sweet tea. Gradually your ribs sank into the waxing flesh I'd come to know like my own. The night on my porch, when I first undid the milkmaid braid from my hair, my temples daubed with rose oil, baby powdered scalp, elder cedar crooning in the yard, early peonies, olfactory romance, June's warm spell, an invitation to strip down. Our undressed bodies, always allegory. Our love made us fabulous. We tell our story and tell it again when I tug your shirt sleeve, open your buttons. The sheet beneath you is green buffalo plaid banked by patchwork quilts. This is our December bed, the yarn of our winters. Frost hugs the window. We wear goose flesh, yawning skin. You sing Frosty Le Bonhomme and my heart becomes a snow globe. Each Glittering snowflake charm chimes, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. It is almost our anniversary when northern flickers hammer our roof in the morning. Magnolia buds split their pink lips. 
I lick the same raindrop off the tip of your nose as I've licked for the last six springs. It still tastes like a vow, but today I will write a poem to mark the occasion. Okay, we're gonna go way back now for my final poem that I'm reading. Um, we're gonna go to um, this memoir that I wrote, How Poetry Saved My Life, a Hustler's Memoir. Um, it's a combination of prose and poetry. Don't ever let anyone tell you when you're writing your memoir that you can't mix genres, you can. So um, I did it and um, I even included work um, in it that was quite old. Um, so I'm gonna read you like the very, one of the very first poems I ever wrote in my whole life. Um, and I wrote it in maybe 1996. Um, so when your creative writing professors tell you to hold on to work, hold on to work. <laughs> um, you never know when that work can revisit uh, and be shared with others. This final poem is called, There Are the Romances That Stick to that song, that baby toe, that particular hue of blue, that constant twister of cherry blossoms in April on the corner of Second and Commercial. Romances that stick to you long after they've ended. And then there are the romances you barely remember at all. They turn up in your memory like a key found in the pocket of a coat you haven't worn for ages or a phone number scribbled on the last page of the self-help book written by a Buddhist nun from Los Angeles, which you always fell asleep while reading, even on the bus, and there is no name beside that phone number. I don't remember the girl whose father's front yard was strewn with Studebaker and Bugatti skeletons, a battleground of chrome bones, rusted limbs reaching for my ankles as I snuck to her window at night. Her own car was a Galaxy Ford 500, mint green with a paler mint interior, no radio, only distance between us. Those bucket seats were so far apart. The crickets desperate hymn along the back roads we drove, the sour smell of sumac growing in the ditch, her cigarette smoke floating above her head like a halo that refused to wholly commit itself to her head. I remember, but not her eyes, her clothes, the words she must have said or didn't. I imagine this girl, now a woman, has also forgotten the sterling silver eagle earrings I wore every day that summer. The way August poured freckles on my shoulders and nose that I worked the snow cone machine at a traveling fair, and if they were going to Montana, I would go with them because I heard there was nothing but fields of sunflowers there. And I loved long drives, how you could close your eyes and then open them again, and everything around you had changed. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes my reading for this morning. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, and I love questions. Ask questions, drop them in the chat. Um, I also um, am a rambler, so I'll try to keep my answers tight. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, for sharing your poetry with us, Amber Dawn. Um, a, it was a bit of a wild ride, I have to admit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, tapping into some, uh, you know, deep emotional spaces that are that are sometimes traumatic, but also, um, but I also found myself swooning at the imagery. Um, so, mm -hmm. so thank thank you for that. I think that's that's the point of poetry, right? Is to yeah. is to make those magic rides yeah um so i um chris uh is your friend and is is a poet as well and so any any questions and dialogue around around that art form i will leave to him i i look um as my job as the uh, program coordinator for the center in sexual and gender diversity and you know organizer for pride i, I look at things a little bit differently um, and because of that personal and emotional and sometimes traumatic 
space that you're discussing, I'm wondering what does self care look like for you when mm. you tap into those those places, especially when it's perhaps a, about pain and trauma. What what mm -hmm. how do you take care of yourself as mm -hmm. an artist? Yeah, this is a really great question, and I think a lot of us are thinking about that, and um, maybe even thinking about it more acutely as um, artists and innovators, um, you know, and, and scholars and thinkers are turning to online platforms. You know, so we will all log off of here in, you know, about 25 minutes, and Who knows what's next you know like we're not necessarily going to um go out for a meal together or get to you know um have these little um side conversations where um we really see each other you know and i i do think that now is the time to really invest deeply in self-care um as a writer there is some aspect of self-care or um, therapeutic elements to writing itself for me um, I went to very, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in my late 40s now when I did my creative writing um, education. Uh, it's a, it was a bit of an older school time. So there was a lot of like, writing is not therapy. Creative writing is not therapy. You know, and I always argued, I always argued that, right? It, it can be therapeutic and it should be therapeutic. I think anything that allows you to connect to the five senses has um, a way of deepening our self-awareness. Uh, so, you know, listening to my poetry, and again, thank you so much for your kind attention and for listening. You'll notice there's a lot of um, visual imagery, you know, there's a lot of tactile, like touch imagery, um, you know, like the image of like licking a raindrop off my wife's nose uh, is intimate, but it's also, you know, creates that little sensation. Uh, so that's important to me now. Creating um, sensation is huge, and um, I love the simplicity of it. So creating moments where you know I can feel my body, I can touch my body, um, and um, like slow down and really enjoy things. Like um, I've taken to drinking now my morning espresso with um, chocolate coconut milk, but like even just the that kind of like silky richness when I drink it, I try to pause for a second and be like, that feels nice, you know? It's it's simple, uh, for me it's accessible and it feels nice. So I, I do think um, turn to your five senses um, or, or to whatever capacity you experience the five senses um, and, and just really find joy in it if you can. Um, and you know the thing that we're all going to have to learn and learn and learn and learn again is to say no to some things and actually sit with that as being a victory um i've learned to say no to some things but i haven't learned to not feel guilty afterwards for like say a day sometimes multiple days you know if i say no to something that i think is important but i just don't have the capacity i will then you like do that dance in my mind where I feel some level of guilt or some level of like, do I really not have enough capacity to do this? So um, I think that's lifelong learning for all of us to, to realize what our capacity is to say no to some things, to be um, mindful about what we can and can't do, and to hopefully not um, use up our precious um, mental and emotional energy feeling guilty for having limitations, you know, and having boundaries. So there's my, including with your own writing practice, have boundaries with your own writing practice. I talk to, um, you know, I talk to writers who are working on their memoir and they'll, at some point, you know, so many um, writers who I mentor, so many colleagues will say, I'm at the very painful part of writing. I'm like, can you take a break? Like, and sometimes there's a deadline you can't, but like if you can take breaks, if you can find um, the sweet spot in terms of um, nurturing yourself before you go back to some of this painful writing, gosh, do it, you know, like do it, take care of yourselves. So yeah, thank you for that question. It's a great question to lead with. And, I, and I'm sure many of you listening have your own techniques that you have probably had to really lean into um, in terms of self-care this year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, and I, you know, you open up so many more questions about 
you know, the, the gendered, um, gendered expectations of, of that personal martyrdom and, and, and all of those that we constantly have to unpack. So th thank you for that. Um, I think you've got a really great question coming to you from the, from the chat here. So ML oh, Martin is, um, thank you for your reading, powerful and beautiful poems. Wondered if you might share with us what you're reading lately. What are some of your favorite recommendations these days for poetry, lyric essays, mm -hmm. etc.? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to be way out there and say that my reading during the pandemic slowed down a lot, um, especially when I'm teaching. And for those of you that are having to read uh, for academic purposes, you know, um, it, if you find yourself with a shortage of um, being able to read for pleasure or read for curiosity, read for your own, um, you know, joy, and that's not as available. It's, you're not the only one. <laughs> um, so my reading has slowed down. And I've actually, as far back as I can remember, I've been, I had a fear of the cross. Okay, sorry, there was a little sound. <laughs> there was a little sound clip there. Um, and that's okay. But one of the things that I wanted to say is I've been turning to YA novels more and more. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, YA typically as a genre is a great place um, to forward identity, um, to forward like desire and curiosity um, and struggle in a way that's really active. Um, you know, we say that YA is a really, um, like it's like, a, it's, I don't know, it gets a bad rap as being like, perhaps a more simplified, like a less intellectually rigorous genre, but I love young adult novels. Um, so some of the ones that I've been reading um, are A Song Below Water by Bethany Morrow. Um, and that uh, she's a black author who lives in Portland, very queer book as well. So A Song Below Water. Um, for, for fun and pleasure, Red, White and Royal Blue. Um, which is a favorite of many um, LGBTQ2S people, Casey uh, McQuinson. Um, and then uh, I have been still reading memoir as much as I can. And the last memoir that I read that I just, just love. And for any of you that are interested in memoir, writing it, or just really interested in the genre and innovations in the memoir genre, How We Fight for Our Lives by Saeed Jones is just incredible. It's, it's, um, it's really challenging. It's really, um, it looks at the crossroads of race, sex, and power. Um, Saeed Jones was also a creative writing major and talks about writing about trauma and identity while being a creative writing student and how that felt for him. Um, so for those of you that are creative writing majors or artists um, of other types, I really strongly recommend this one, How We Fight for Our Lives. Um, and I'll just do one more. I went, I went back to The Lesser Blessed by Richard Van Camp this year as well. Um, I read it when it first came out um, several years ago um, and was really interested in it. I'm really interested in um, young characters being able to explore sexuality um, and have a good, a well-written sex scene, you know? Um, I think that's very important. Um, and I think Richard um, Van Camp did this really, um, really, really well in The Lesser Blessed. Um, and Richard Van Kemp uh, lives in Edmonton as well. Um, he's uh, Chislo Dene, um, grew up in um, the Northwest Territories, I believe, but he's living now in Edmonton. So he's also an author that you could probably see read, um, hopefully at, at, at some point in uh, your own love of books or in your own writing careers, you could see Richard Van Kemp. So those are the four I'm going to recommend right now. Probably the Saeed Jones, We Fight for Our Lives is like really high on my recommend list. I, I think everyone should check out that memoir. Thanks for your question. Great recommendations. Thank you. Now, when Pride's done, I, I can see what my next project is, is re catching up on all of this reading. So <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so if, if folks have questions, of course, you can pop them into the chat. Um, but feel free also to, to turn your mic on or, and your video yeah. and, and, and join us here.
Um, I grow tired of my own voice because I've been doing this all week. So the less I talk, the better. Uh, so the floor, the floor is open. Also, if there is anyone online right now who is working on memoir or working on um, poetry that's um, very personal, um, I, I'd love for you to unmic yourself too and just introduce yourself, let me know what you're working on if you have any craft questions as well. Um, that's, that's kind of the great joy of my life actually is, is meeting other writers and, and hearing um, what they're up to, including hearing that they're hitting a hard, you know, a, a challenging point in the writing process. Um, the challenges are real. I, I, <laughs> I can affirm that for you. Um, I guess I'll jump in here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Emily. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I'm one of Chris's students. Um, I'm a third year creative writing minor. Um, and I was just wondering, like, what are some common mistakes that you see young writers making in whatever genre, like, just general question, um, even with like publishing or like marketing yourself, just okay. things of that nature. Um, <laughs> big question, I know, but. It's a really big question. I could go so many different places, <laughs> um, but I'm, and I am, I'm gonna spitball a few different places to kind of respond to that. Um, I think first and foremost is it, I do truly feel it takes a while for most writers to figure out who they are and what's like that unique thing that um, we can bring into this world that another writer can't. Um, you know, and we, mo you know, most creative writing programs and English programs, we read authors that have quite a bit of publishing experience. Um, I hope that gets mixed up with emerging authors, you know, writers who are having their first books or writers who even don't have their first book yet, but are um, starting to publish in literary magazines. Um, I think it's really important to read new writers. Um, so I think the mistake is, you know, just reading kind of like the canonical or like sort of like the Canlit prize readers winners, which are which are great like i'm not saying don't read um you know like don't read someone like thomas king of course you know read lee miracle read the prize winners read of the acclaimed um authors um but read emerging authors you know read actively seek out and read other authors who are having um their first work come out um, i think this is really important um so for example, you know, one of my friends, Jay Simpson, um, just published their first uh, collection of poetry um, and they started as a slam poet and moved into poetry on the page and more lyrical work. Um, uh, Jay Simpson, uh, I believe the book's called No One Told Us This Would Be Okay, but I'm gonna Google that after your question and drop it into the chat. Um, you know what, and I, I just think it's really important to go through the process of reading emerging writers so that you can get closer to who you are as a new writer. I always say to my students, like, let yourself be new. Like, it's a really fertile, generative time when you're new um, and you're not in a literary realm where you're with people that have four or five books out yet. You know, like, it's actually great. I would love to go back there and. Be <laughs> and be like unpublished and just exploring things in, in a fresh way. So um, relish that time, let yourself be new and give yourself sincere time to figure out who you are and what you want to say. Um, and then I guess the other thing that um, I want to put out there, especially to all the memoirists and to all um, the poets and the essayists who are really working with um, self as um, the content, you know, so working with memoir based material. Um, you don't owe your reader everything. Um, and memoir is so much more than just an account of stuff that happened to you. Um, so really think about what your credo is or like what your driving force is, what you want to say to your reader, what kind of connection you want to have with your future reader and what feels good for you. Like, we think of writing as something we just give, you know, like eventually we have a piece that we think is finished enough. We put it out there in the world and this is kind of our, 
our gift um, or our expression that we give to the reader. Um, but think about yourself somewhere in there and like what you want to actually get out of your own relationship with your writing. Um, what's comfortable for you, you know, treat your writing like a date, like, you know, you have things that are on your like, yes, I do this on a date. That sounds fun for me. And like, no, here's my boundaries. This is off the table for me in a date, you know, treat writing like that as well. Um, and uh, I'm not saying if you treat writing like that, there's no challenges, there's not going to be grief or there's not going to be a, a, like hardship as you write. Um, but there should also for sure be joy and personal rewards beyond just handing in an assignment. Um, so that would be the other thing. And then the third thing is like, if you're in a workshop environment, w watch yourself and how much you compare yourself to the other writers in your workshop. Um, being a writer is kind of like getting a job performance review all the time, except everyone knows what your performance review is. Like, you know, like, you know, who's written a really good first draft and I went to workshop, you know, who's kind of struggling. Like, it's so easy to compare ourselves to others. Um, so as much as it is an environment where we see each other's process, we see each other's work, like really try to watch if there's that voice in your head that starts to compare and it and it turns into negative thinking really try to watch that um you know if you can keep yourself in a good um generative nurturing relationship with your writing process i promise you it's gonna go further than if that those negative thoughts and the fear you know and the and the self-pressure take over i don't follow my own advice like fear is my blanket like it keeps me warm it's half of what i do comes from fear and anger uh you know but i also know that there, there, i need to watch myself like i really need to watch those negative thoughts still to this day um because it, it's it's gonna um it's, it's going to hamper your writing process. You know, it's going to weigh it down with things that aren't about you. You don't need that. You need your writing process to just be about you. So there's my, <laughs> there's my very kind of woo, woo, still very self care type of <laughs> uh, approach to the writing, you know, and then of course, invest in your craft. Like it really, really think about, um, different craft techniques that can be employed in anything that you do. If you're writing a poem and you're like, this poem's gonna work with repetition, why? Like, why should this phrase in a poem be repeated? You know, like always do the deep craft uh, reach as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, and to your first point, I think actually, Chris, um, Liz Howard, um, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent. That's her debut book, isn't yes. it? Yeah, yeah. And yes, it's so it, it good. is. Yeah, <laughs> we're reading so that. It's so good. And she's great. If you're on Twitter, follow her on Twitter. Like she, I love her tweets. It's she's got a very down to earth um, things to say about writer's life as well and about writing practice. Um, she's she's not only is the work so good. She's like a wonderful inspiring person to to know where to follow so yeah liz howard you, you can't go wrong with liz howard <laughs> yeah. i really liked um your emphasis on on the self-care aspect and about you know doing your craft deeply and being very aware of yourself um and everything and that seems um, <clears throat> usually when people ask for business type advice, we get a very business type answer, very rooted in, in capitalism. And your your approach seems to be um, quite quite different um, from that, you know, and it's that uh, the deconstructing the reasons why um, we do the work that we do, I think is really important. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we have another question coming from Maddie M. Um, could you tell us a bit about your publishing experience? Traditional publisher versus self, agent versus no agent. If you received any rejections, how many times um, did you receive them before you were published? And what did you do after those reaction, after those rejections? Yeah, that's that's a great question and, and probably will be our final question looking at the time. So I'm going to keep it concise. Um, but if 
um, this question is still very much burning on your mind. I am also on Twitter, just on Amber Dawn Wright. So it's, it's really easy to find me as well. Um, I did what one is supposed to do to um, bring writing career from emerging or learner stage to published and successful author. Um, and by that, I mean, I did a BFA in creative writing and I did an MFA in creative writing at UBC. Um, I pitched to agents. I pitched to top tier publishers. I made sure that I worked with a thesis advisor who could um, help me as best as she could. Um, and when I was at UBC doing my MFA, I was, I was working on this exact book. I was working on a memoir. I was welcome into the program to work on memoir. Um, as I mentioned, I am an experiential sex worker and a great deal of my time as a sex worker was street involved. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm clean and sober after having um, a journey around drug use as well. And I lived and worked in the downtown east side for a long time in Vancouver. So that would be a neighborhood that's had um, a, a, a grave number of missing and murdered women, especially indigenous women. So people were really interested in my story. Um, people were really interested in my story and I was kind of on my way. Um, and I had an ethical calling where I was like, what is the responsibility of a white woman who survived? Um, and, and the Picton trial was going on at the time. I'm not gonna get into the depths of that, but it was a trial that brought up a lot of grief and uh, um, it called me into something higher. So I actually abandoned my memoir. I was like, I, I'm not, I don't have the maturation of my ethics um, or my positionality as a white survivor yet to put out this memoir. So I stopped. I chose me and I chose my own personal growth over a story. And people were like, get this story out, get it out. Maybe you can get it out while the Picton trial is still on. Like you could sell this book for quite a bit of money. Um, but I, I just couldn't do it. So <laughs> what looked like a really um, successful publishing trajectory really turned around. I ended up writing a fantasy novel as my thesis. Super big disappointment to my thesis advisor. She was, she didn't love it. No one at UBC loved it. Um, I love it. It's called Sabrosa. It's about like um, magical sex workers that form their own society. I thought it was great. And I couldn't, you know, my, the agent that was interested in me didn't want it. They were like, show me what your next project is, but we're not, we don't want this. Publisher after publisher said no. I was like, oh, I didn't sell my trauma story. And I didn't sell that trauma story fast enough. So I'm out, I'm out. And uh, I have no regrets. Um, I found a publisher for Subros in my first novel, the fantasy novel. Um, their Arsenal Pulp Press. They're um, sort of a mid-sized publisher here in Vancouver. Um, the only publisher owned by a gay man of color. I felt really good about that. And then after Sabrosa was out, I took my time with this memoir. And I, I waited till I was as ready as I could be. Um, and, I, and I checked my ethics. So I can't tell you about what it's like to secure an agent. I can't tell you what it's like to secure like a $20,000 or more advance. Um, I can tell you what it's like to choose myself and to go with a publisher that made me feel comfortable, that didn't rush me, um, that invested in my work, even if it wasn't like gonna sell for a lot in the book marketplace. Um, and, I, and I say I have no regrets. Um, and, and, um, literary agents are changing. There's there's uh, queer literary agents now. There's a lot more um, black and brown literary agents now. So for those of you looking for an agent, it's go hopefully going to look more um, supportive and more nurturing than it did for me, you know, 20 years ago. So I'm I'm rooting for change in the literary world. Um, I'm rooting for stories to not be tokenized or like consumed but actually truly uplifted um and, and i think that's and i think that's coming and again like queer and trans um literary professionals are are creating a lot of that change so fucking a we're awesome and um 
<laughs> I know we're just a couple minutes away from logging off. So I think maybe my last words are fucking A. We're awesome. As basic as that is, that that might be that might be my final thought for you all this morning. <laughs> What a great note to leave on, um, and I, I heartily concur, fucking A. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us, Amber. Um, your, your, Amber Dawn, your, your energy is, is infectious, and um, your, it's very clear that your, your art is driven by deep love and uh, deep passion. So um, I'm, I feel so, so fortunate to have listened to you this morning. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Chris has un unmuted, I think, has a few things to add. Thank you, Amber Don. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and happy Pride, everyone at McEwen. Um, celebrate you. the genius weirdos that you are. <laughs> <laughs> genius weirdos, I love it. Um, now, I, I am going to just put my, my work hat on for one more moment. If um, the participants in today's um talk could take a moment to just do a participant feedback for us it helps to make sure that i can continue to plan excellent quality events for pride and um to bring in people such as amber dawn to share their to share their lives with us so um i'm i'm excited to spend some of my personal uh, my, my pennies on buying some some poetry books from you amber dawn so thank you thank you thank you and with that, um, thank you everyone for being here. Happy Pride and enjoy the rest of a beautiful day and um, fucking A. Fucking A. <laughs>